From the Mecca of Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah, this is Heart of the Matter, where Mormonism meets Biblical Christianity face-to-face. -face, I'm your host, Sean McCraney. If you have family or friends who can't watch the show live here on television, they have two sources they can turn to. Go to www.hotm.tv and they can watch the show streaming video from anywhere in the world. You can also tune in, if you're in the Salt Lake Valley, to AM820. Uh, the Truth Radio, they play uh, Heart of the Matter right at the same time for people who are in their cars or don't have televisions. Really great programming there on The Truth, so check that out. I was a born-again Mormon. Some quick endorsements from the book from Craig Hazen at Biola. His provocative ideas about the born-again Mormon need to be considered very carefully by the Latter-day Saints and Evangelical Christians everywhere. Carl Westerlin. Born Again Mormon is perhaps the best book a Christian could give to an LDS friend today. McCraney compassionately and fairly contrasts his 40 years as an active Latter-day Saint with the life-altering truth that Jesus is the only means of salvation, a great read for any Christian, a must-read for every Latter-day Saint. LDS physician Adam Braithwaite wrote, McCraney wisely avoids the tired and rehashed anti-Mormon approach so often employed. Instead, he offers an almost apologetic view on Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and early church history. English teacher uh, Ken DeMarco wrote, McCraney's book, Born Again Mormon, is a book that is as authentic in its compassion for Mormons as it is theologically rigorous. It is written in the spirit in which all Christian apologetics should be written. So you can pick up I Was a Born Again Mormon at utlm.org or go to the store itself at Oasis Books, Christian Gift and Bible in Sandy, New Life Books in Layton, Sam Weller's downtown, Salt Lake City, uh, Salt Lake City Calvary Chapel and other Calvary Chapel stores around the western U.S. primarily. Dolly's Books in Park City, Gift of Grace and Bible in Springville and at www.bornagainmormon.com. Hey, if you are one of those who are sitting back and have been pretending for all these years, have you abandoned ship yet? If you don't know what that means, it means written your letter to asking to have your name removed from the records of the LDS Church. If you don't know what to do, go to utlm.org or bornagainmormon.com for instructions. And then take the step and remove your name from the rules of the institution. Some people say, why? Well, one, why not show them up there on North Temple that you will not be controlled by their threats of damnation any longer if you don't accept Joseph Smith and that you, Jesus is enough for you, maybe your departure will reemphasize that you want to hear the Bible taught and to get rid of all these lives of the prophets garbage that they make you go through. Maybe you will pave the way for others in your life, family and friends who will see that you've done it and you don't combust. And so maybe they'll look at your example and say, well, I'll do the same thing. And finally, you'll be sending a message loud and clear, I want out. This is over. It's dead in my heart. I want to stand before God someday and exclaim, you were enough for me. Go to utlm.org, bornagainmormon.com, and you can learn how to write the letter, where to send the letter, and how to abandon ship. Get your calendars out and ready. Mark Friday, December 5th from 7 to 9 p.m. right here at the studios, 314 South Redwood Road, Salt Lake City for the second annual KTMW Christmas Open House. Food, giveaways, songs, dancing creatures, Christmas cheer. Come by and say hello to all the hosts right here on their sets. There's a lot of uh, very kind people. It was a great event last year, Friday, December 5th from 7 to 9 p.m. Well, on election day last year, I said that biblical Christianity has no business getting involved in political issues in order to try and save the world from itself. Christianity ought to be a light, not a moral police force to the world. How can we get the lost to receive Christ if their only understanding comes from campaigns and street rallies and protests? When Jesus was brought before Pilate to be condemned to Roman crucifixion, he made a very interesting comment. He said in John 18:36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. 
that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Commenting on the vitality and importance of what Jesus said to Pilate on this very occasion, Paul wrote later in 1 Timothy 6.13 that Jesus witnessed a good confession before Pilate. A confession that was not according to the ways of the world. Again, should we pray fervently, always, for the conditions of the world, for political leaders, for uh, uh, things like that? Should we love always, endlessly? Should we share our faith unabashedly? Absolutely. But I don't believe we're out to try to, we should be out to try to monitor and govern the world. Over the past week, we have seen firsthand why this stance is so important. In California, there was an initiative on the ballot to ban same-sex marriage. It was nicknamed the Mormon Initiative in California as the LDS Church threw themselves behind it. I uh, drove through our hometown with my family and saw on three separate places, three separate wards from the community gathered out there in mass protesting and, and waving and signs and everything else campaigning out on the street. Well, California voters passed the initiative and in response, homosexual promoters have gathered, protesters have gathered around LDS temples all over to publicly display their disdain for the church's involvement. Now, some may be of the impression that the LDS church is to be admired for their public stance. Good for them. Uh, they stand for something. Bravo. Tally ho, shout the evangelical Christians at the right. Even the, on the evangelical television shows and radio shows, they're applauding their stance on that. But I find the collective institutional, and remember the collective institutional LDS stance, neither commendable nor truly Christian. All it shows me is that their kingdom is of this world. What Mormonism did was merely use their money and their muscle and their influence to have their way politically. Ask yourselves, where will these involvements end? When and if Mormonism is big enough and strong enough, will it rally its people to reinstitute prohibition too? What about polygamy and blood atonement? Will they someday demand observance of special Sabbath day laws, which they have done here before? Are these these were very important moral issues to the LDS at one time. What I'm trying to say here is there's nothing heroic or necessarily Christian about the LDS involvement in getting Prop 8 passed in California. I don't think Jesus would have been publicly into the display had this been his time for ministry. But then again, what Jesus stood for has never really mattered to the LDS institution when it comes to what they do, has it? Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we ask you in the midst of much turmoil throughout this world to be with us and send your peace. Be with our audience here, our audience uh, wherever they may be. Help me to say the things you want me to say as we go through and compare Mormonism with biblical Christianity tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight's show is really going to live up to the claim where Mormonism meets biblical Christianity. So get your Bibles out, my friends. It's uh, going to be one where we're going to talk about the word of wisdom relative to what the Bible says about what we eat and what we drink. Over the past few, few weeks, we've had a brief but good look at the LDS doctrine called the Word of Wisdom, found in section 89 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It's the code that says they cannot today drink coffee or tea, alcohol of any kind, any type of tobacco products or harmful drugs. We've looked at the origin of the revelation, Joseph Smith's failure to obey it, and how it was optional for 75 years, yet has today become a mandate for salvation and the primary indicator for a person being worthy. Well, just what does the Bible say about human beings and what we eat and drink? We're going to step back and we're going to quickly go through. And there, I found some things that blew my mind. I didn't really realize these, these passages were there and the context in which they sat. So let's look at that. Now, as we move along in this quick discussion, ask yourself gently, why did God Almighty create the coffee bean? And why did he create tea leaves? And why did he create grapes that ferment and animal meat that tastes so darn good? I mean, ask yourself those questions. 
Originally, it seems God granted the use of vegetables and fruits for the food for man. We read in Genesis, listen to these passages closely, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food. Okay, so he says there, I've given you every herb and every tree, and for you it shall be meat, it says in the King James, which means it shall be your food. I'm of the personal opinion, and I could be wrong here, but from what I read, I'm of the personal opinion that the people on earth did not eat meat prior to the flood. Um, it seems to be supported by the Bible. Nevertheless, we do know that after the flood, Noah is given a distinct law about eating animals. And this is found in Genesis 9, 2 through 4. It says, listen, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your, your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. Okay? So it's pretty straightforward stuff. When the children of Israel fled from Egypt, God, wanting to raise up and protect a peculiar people from mixing with the surrounding pagan nations, instituted a number of things that would help keep them separated uh, from the rest of the nomadic, quite frankly, uh, evil tribes of people. And their dietary laws were very effective in, help to, uh, in helping to accomplish this. We can read about those dietary laws in Leviticus 11. These restrictions automatically and immediately segregated the children of Israel from the rest of the proverbial world. This was, in my opinion, the primary motivation for the dietary laws. Health was important too, but I believe it was primarily to keep them seg segregated and peculiar. But where Joseph Smith's word of wisdom has God say that meat was not good and that strong drink and wine are not so good, there was actually a lot of liberty in God's plan for the children of Israel and what they could eat and drink. In fact, God allows wine, meat, and strong drink in the Bible for the children of Israel. Listen to the tenor of God's commands and the liberty that comes forth in Deuteronomy 14.25 and 26. Now, in Deuteronomy 14.25, God is talking about money. And then in verse 26, he says, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth, after for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. So where God's covenant people were permitted to eat as much of these meats as they so lusted, and they were allowed to buy and even drink strong drink and wine, Joseph's God outdid himself with his restrictions and said, No, 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 you can't have any of that even though Joseph continued to say, yes, 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 it's pure manipulation. The introduction of the true and living monotheistic God to the children of Israel and the law and these dietary commands served to some extent to keep the children of Israel separate from the world, but they did very little to separate them from sin and from rebellion. This fact underscores the difference between the children of Israel and the law and Christians living by faith in this dispensation of grace. Outwardly, they were able to appear righteous by following these things, but inwardly they were still sinful and this is why they weren't able to keep up. Where today true Christians inwardly are cleansed by the blood of Christ while outwardly they may make uh, they may live in all different manners and still be acceptable by God. 
In Acts chapter 15, well after Jesus ascended into heaven, a group of Pharisees attempted to reinstitute part of the law, the rite of circumcision, and put it back on the backs or other parts of the Gentile converts. In response to this Pharisaical appeal to religion, Acts chapter 15 says, quote, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much dis disputing, Peter rose up and he said unto them, Listen, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us and the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. The apostles knew that it would be impossible to keep the Gentile nation and converts from their sinful, rebellious ways by adding circumcision back into the dispensation of grace. They knew that it didn't matter what days they worshiped on or what they ate or what they drank. It was faith that saves them. Herein is the main difference between the law and grace, religion and relationship, outward adherence versus inward change. In preparation for what he was about to accomplish, Jesus began to introduce to some of his followers transitional thinking that would move them away from the outward observances and toward inward allegiances. He said in Matthew 15, 11, quote, Not that which goeth into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. I don't mean to be offensive, but did you hear that, Bishop? Jones, stake president, Miller, Thomas S. Monson. After Jesus said this line, the, his disciples came up to him and they said, Jesus, Jesus, the Pharisees were offended by what you said. You know, maybe rubbing their hands and like they're really offended by that. And Jesus said, quote, do you not yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth out into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. I would place all my money on the drunkard, the smoker, the addict who knows the Lord's gospel of grace to enter heaven over a teetotaling aesthetic who thinks because he has never smoked or never drank uh, alcohol is going to be more worthy to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Yet Mormonism today has resurrected these legalisms and requires all to obey who want to receive what they say is necessary for salvation. And then they put them in the temple for more rites and more rituals and more legalistic demands. Paul made the point perfectly clear in Romans chapter 14, 17, when he said, listen, quote, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, end quote. You see, once Jesus died, erased sin, death, disease, and outer and inner filth permanently from the lives of all those who believe, past, present, and future, what people eat or drink doesn't mean a big, fat thing. Once Jesus erased sin, death, disease, outer and inner filth from the lives of all those who believe. You see, there is no need for special dietary laws anymore or regulations to keep believers separate from the world. The gospel was now open to all. The veil was ripped open and at, when, at Jesus' death, signifying top to the bottom, everybody gets it. There's no more of this 
uh, segregation going on. Did you hear that? The way is open to all, all people, all black people. All white people, yellow people, Gentile people, Jewish people, women people, men people, slave people, midget people, gay people, straight people, sinful people, smoker people, drinker people, people who dress badly people, people who dress goodly people, armless people, legless people, freakless people, freaky people, regardless of who they are, what they've done, what they continue to do, if they have one glass of wine, if they drink the bottle, if they're addicted to cigarettes, if they're not, if they've lived clean lives which have been beneficial to their health, or if they are dying of cancer because of their actions, if they believe and have faith in Jesus Christ, they're saved! Yeah. How about a few more? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8.8, 8, listen, but meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we for the better, neither if we eat not are we for the worse. Speaking of all legalisms, Paul wrote in Colossians 2.16, Let no man judge you therefore in meat or in drink or in respect to a holy day or of a new moon or of Sabbath days. No man should judge anybody else by what, they, what their diet is. What, they, uh, what drinks they consume, whether they obey a Sabbath day or a season of the year or a special time, or obey or not, observe or don't. We aren't to judge anybody for that because that is not what God judges us by. Paul says it. It's in the scripture. Does that sound like Mormonism? Paul in 1 Timothy 4 said that, In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith meaning the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, meaning they will say this lie and then they'll do the opposite, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, that means acting and speaking outside of God's will without a care, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. All this being said, there is perhaps no better summation of the biblical Christian approach to eating and drinking of any and all things than what is found in Romans chapter 14. It's so profound. It's so important. It is so contradictory a chapter to how the LDS live and what they propose in the word of wisdom. I'm going to take the time. It won't be long to read through the whole thing. Open up to Romans chapter 14 if you want to follow along or at least write it down because it is going to summarize God's exact thoughts on, on this eating and drinking thing. Are you ready? Verse 1, him that is weak in the faith receive, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believes that he may eat all things, another who is weak eats only herbs. Let not him that eateth all things despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God has received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? Meaning, we are all serving Christ. Who are we to judge Christ's servant in anything. To his own master he stands or falls. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Is that liberty in Christ or what? There are people who like to take special days and say, you're not following that special day. It says right there, if you esteem a day and you think it's important, go for it. If you don't, it's no big deal. That's liberty in Christ. He that regardeth the day, verse 6, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. For he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For we, whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and re revived, 
that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? This is the crux of it. Or why dost thou set not for thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Meaning, if something is evil in your heart and you personally have something against it, don't do it. But if you are full of liberty in your life with Christ and you can eat and drink and obey whatever day you don't and want and it doesn't bug you, you're okay. That's the law of, of Romans 14 and the rest of the word. Then in verse 13, he gives a rule of love to consider. He said, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. But judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus, listen to this, that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died." Let not your good, your liberty, be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What he's saying there is if somebody doesn't like to eat meat, and, and don't be a Christian that eats meat in front of them and, and, and offends them. If somebody doesn't believe in drinking alcohol, don't be drinking alcohol in front of them. That's what, the, that's what he's saying. Don't cause another person to stumble by doing that in front of them. That's what the whole message is. Therefore, Follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith may edify one another. For meat destroys not the work of God. All things indeed are pure. All things indeed are pure. All things indeed are pure. But it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. I mean, it's evil if we try to get somebody to fall. It'd be evil for me to, to drink in front of an alcoholic. That's not right for me to do. If I love him as my brother, I'm not going to tempt him with that. That's the law, the law of love. Not what you eat or drink. It is neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Listen to this. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he allows. If you allow it, happy are you. Do it. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I think you should reread chapter 14 if you still have doubts about it. That's the biblical stance. We're going to go to a brief message and come back and wrap this up and take your calls. See you then. Hi, I'm John. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. And we're the pastoral staff at Calvary Tampa. Christian assemblies meeting to prayerfully understand scripture. All three of us are present at the University of Utah Sunday morning from 915 to 1015 a.m. at the Webb building at 72 Central Campus Drive. locations from 7 to 8. I'm at Ingram State University at 3848 Harrison Boulevard at the Shepherd Union Building, room 331. And I'm at the Hello, Nutrition boys. and Science Building at Utah State in Logan, room 202, also known as the Aggie Ice Cream Building, 725 North Wall Street East. And I remain at the University of we're going to open up the phone lines, 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Listen, my friends, any fool can make a rule, and any Peter, any leader can talk like Peter. I made that last one up. <laughs> any leader can talk like Peter. Uh, but the liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be counterfeited or feigned. There is no worthiness that God sees in you because of what you eat or drink or because of what you've avoided in eating and drinking. Righteousness and worthiness was singularly offered in the form of his son once and for all. Eat well? Sure. Why not? It's good advice. Avoid addictions? Absolutely. It's good. Never do anything to cause somebody to stumble? Sure. If I went to a place and everybody was a vegetarian, I would not order the bloody lamb. If uh, I was sitting with friends who didn't drink or an alcoholic or any of that, I wouldn't drink. If I was sitting with children, I, I probably would never drink. I don't drink anyway, but I wouldn't do it especially in front of them. I mean, that's the law of love. It's not what you eat and drink. Don't ever think, however, that you are worthy or better than another because you have 
forbidden in your life what they might enjoy. Clear lungs and a healthy body might mean good health, but it's a clear heart made clean by the Lord that means you're the good Christian. All right, let's continue on. The phone line's opening up. Operators are answering uh, calls. We're going to go to Ruth and Layton. First time call in a minute, but quickly, I want to read two quick emails. From Joan, Sean, I am a born-again Christian, former Mormon. I have faithfully studied the Bible as well as read LDS history and doctrine. I am ashamed to say that I still have a wavering spirit. I keep fearing that I've lost my salvation will be spending an eternity in outer darkness. My question to you is, did you struggle with the same feeling? And what would you suggest that would bring me peace? I felt such peace as a member of the LDS church, and I don't feel that now. I'm confused and frankly fearful. Would appreciate anything you have to offer about this situation. And she goes on and thanks us for the show. Uh, I want you to know, Joan, a couple things. Uh, Jesus said, when you follow him, it gets pretty tough down here. You're like a secret agent in the fallen world. And, uh, you know, Christians, they have difficulty. The LDS Church is a peaceful place. You walk in and it's all really catered and toned to feelings and emotion. And the, lights, the lighting's right, the temperature's right, they have the means. Uh, people call you brother and sister. You sing hymns, you don't have a lot of rock Christian music, some of which I hate. And so you, you, you have an experience there where you sense this peace. But I want you to reflect in your mind, could you go back as a Christian to embrace the things that they teach, the doctrines that they embrace? That's what I do. If I ever wonder about some of those visceral feelings that we have as a Latter-day Saint, I start thinking, well, let me go back in my mind. Could I be LDS again? And I think about what they actually teach and believe and hope to become and look to do, and I become sickened inside. Another thing that helps is reading the Bible. To me, I read through the Word and I try to understand it, and that makes it clear what God's way is, which is not always the easy, peaceful road, versus what is offered here in this world. So I hope that helps. Um, one more. I was wondering if you could give me some advice. This is from Michelle. My mom and I are both Christians, but she was baptized, and I... Uh, do a lot of watching of your show. My mom gets frustrated with me because I haven't gotten baptized and I don't witness to people. Basically, she says I'm not a born-again Christian, but only God knows my heart. I do not feel comfortable talking to others about Jesus. I was wondering if you could give some thoughts about this, if you had any advice, etc., etc., from Michelle. Uh, you know what? God does not uh, convert you and put you uh, on a uh, soapbox out on the street immediately. Everybody has different approaches. You know, you might give your, uh, uh, manifest your witness and testimony to people by virtue of your service to them, the love you show, the actions you have. When you are ready, God will open up the door for you to share or speak and you'll be ready to do it then. If you start trying to do it before you're ready, you might find yourself in, in some situations that are going to be very ugly because you're doing it by your own arm or your flesh. I fully believe in trusting God in all things and let him lead. As far as baptism goes, again, do it when you're ready. We see people quite often who get baptized and rebaptized and baptized again because they didn't maybe necessarily do it for the right reason the first time. Take it to the Lord, read the Bible, see what it says, see what your heart says, follow him relative to what he's telling you, and you can't go wrong. And don't listen to the pressure of other people. Okay, let's go to Ruth and Layton, first time caller. Ruth, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hi, Sean. Um, I just wanted to make a comment and a question, and then I was going to hang up. Okay. Um, my comment is, I just want to say praise God. Thank you so much for having this show, and, um, you know, thank you for all the people that are behind the scenes working hard. You're welcome. My question is, um, have you noticed with um, people in the LDS Church that they can be really judgmental and really harsh when, you know, they really should be Christ-like? And I just recently had an experience with a bishop who was just so harsh, and I made a comment that there's the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And he just snapped back and said, no, the spirit of the law never trumps the letter of the law. Mm. And he just was so harsh to me and my little family. Mm. And we were going to him for support. And I just thought of you and your show and how you always teach 
that, you know, you should really love one another and not be harsh like that. Yeah. So I just wanted to hear your points on that. And then my second question is, is there a way to donate to your program? Uh, you want me to answer all that off the air? Um, you can answer it on the air. Oh, okay. Or however you want. I mean, you want me to answer it while you are on the phone? Yeah. Well, okay. I'll hang up now, if that's okay. Okay, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, I don't know if Danny knows the one phone is the speaker's not working. Uh, as far as the first, the last question to donate, you can go online and uh, it says uh, to support or donate on the website bornagainmormon.com, and that's only you know if you uh, feel so inclined, led by the Lord, and after you have contributed to your local church. We don't want to take from what's happening in your own uh, church. As far as my comments about the judgmental, it, it definitely happens in Mormonism. It happens in Christianity too. A lot of different denominations can be very much the same way. Uh, within Mormonism, it's more prevalent because they are a legalistic system. And so they've set up things like the Word of Wisdom. And uh, that sets up this standard that if somebody isn't following the standard, the automatic time for it to point fingers and look down noses and things like that. As far as the spirit of the law and letter of the law, uh, the spirit of the law trumps the letter of the law all over the place, all over the place. And that bishop was absolutely incorrect in that. We see uh, Rahab, uh, who was a, 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 not a Jew, who was saved by her faith because she helped uh, uh, some people escaping. We see all kinds of evidences where the spirit of the law absolutely trumps the letter of the law. Um, the, the, the rule of thumb for any Christian, regardless of what church they belong to, is love. And we all fail at love, but the rule of thumb is love, love, love. And uh, that's the best I can say. So if you're not receiving that, you can, Jesus says, you can tell who really follows me by the love that they uh, exhibit to their fellow uh, brothers and sisters. All right, we're going to Golly in uh, West Valley on line three. Golly, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hi, you're on the air. Okay. You got to turn off your TV, golly. Golly. Yeah. Turn down your TV. You're on the air. Okay. <laughs> Is it down? Yeah. Okay, you're on the air. Hey, John. Yep. Um, I'm coming because I, I'm, I'm in uh, Catholic before. Uh-huh. And then I convert to the LDS Jets a while ago. Uh huh. And I disagree what 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 did you say on TV tonight? I saw your your program every Tuesday, but I disagree what you say. What do you disagree with? Huh? What do you disagree with? Let me tell you what, uh, before I tell you what I disagree. See, when Jesus came to the earth. There are lots of church at that time in, in Israel, okay? He never saw in any, any of them, and he organized his own church. Why? Why he, see, like, seem to me, what did you say? Everybody is follow Jesus. But when Jesus came, came to the earth, he organized his own church. Why he never come so in like other churches here on earth before he came to the earth? Uh, golly? Yeah? When you say Jesus organized the church, it's a line straight out of Mormonism and Catholicism. And you have automatically set up a straw man, so to speak, and said, you've given everybody this image that Jesus set up a church, a building. Yeah. I, I don't know where the brick and mortar building is he built, but I can tell you uh, it doesn't exist. What he set up, the Bible is clear that the church is not made of stones. It is made of believers who are lively stones. It is built up of people, not of a religion or a, a, a edifice like a church. Polly, golly. That, that's why, but why Jesus never, when he came to earth, 
There are lots of churches at that time. Why he never saw in another one of them, but he organized his own church. He called his 12 apostle, and, and they started his, his church in the world. When Jesus came, he came not for Gentiles. He came for the children of Israel, which had a very organized religious institution. He did not come to speak to me, a non-Jew. He came to speak to the Jews. That's, it. That's all through the Bible, the, the Gospels. Yeah. And then he organized his 12 apostles who were firsthand witnesses of what he did. He taught them. He prepared them. And then he sent them out into the world and said, go out now, the Great Commission, and share the gospel, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is how the church began. Yeah. Well, we agree. That, that's why I believe, that's why I, I call from Catholic to the LDS church. Of course you did. All of the churches, they, they thought the same thing. Well, golly, the problem is, is you're looking at churches to give you your truth. Why don't you just go straight to the Lord? Why have you had to have a pope and now a prophet? Why don't you just go straight to the Lord yourself? Because you, Be you remember when Amos said, the Lord never do anything to the world until he revealed his, everything to the prophet. Really? Did, okay, if that's true, then you're applying an Old Testament verse to us right yeah. now, which is LDS, straight out of the LDS handbook. Yeah. Did, if, 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 LDS. if that's true, golly, if that's true, did the Lord tell uh, Gordon B. Hinckley about the tsunami that was going to happen? If he won't reveal, if he won't do anything unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophet, the Lord, uh, did he tell... Hinckley, same with the old prophet in the Old Testament. I know you believe that. I'm, yeah. ask, I'm asking you a question. Listen to my question. Listen to my question. Did God reveal to Gordon B. Hinckley that a tsunami was going to come and wipe out those hundreds of thousands of people? Sure, he can. If, if the tsunami coming, something happened to the earth, the Lord tell the prophet. Okay, well, he didn't, he didn't, he, he, if he told Gordon B. Hinckley, Gordon didn't get the news out to the people in the islands. So you're using a, a, a statement, golly, from Amos that is out of context. It does not apply in any way to the New Testament. I know your heart. You sound like someone who longs to know God. I appreciate that. You've been a Catholic. Now you've moved over to being a Mormon. My suggestion is, brother... I know, I know you've been a Mormon before. Uh, I was. I know. I know you're a Mormon before. Yeah. I, I know. You know the book you read? Most of the time, I think, is you, have to, you make up something... To fit what you think about the church is not true. I know why your name is yeah, Golly. Let me tell you. Uh, That's Johnny. all I want to say. Golly! Hey, Johnny, let me tell you. I believe 100% no church in the world is true except the LDS church. I know you, I, I know you believe. Go back to the church and repent and go <laughs> back to the church. Oh. Uh, what do you say on TV? Golly. I, I tell you 100%. Golly. Wrong. Oh, golly. Everything I said was out of the Bible. I, yeah, the Bible. Everything I say is I have quotes for. Everything I have references for. Reference and quote is make up. You it's not made up. Into the Bible, John. It's not right. It is right. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. He called me Shawnee. He called me Johnny. Take off the wooden switch. Okay. Uh, where's our calls? We're going to a DR in Salt Lake City, first time caller. DR, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hey, Sean. Hey, DR. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Your question? Uh, listen, I just wanted to say uh, we watch your show every Tuesday. We love it. Uh, we saw you at Burning Heart. It was awesome. Thanks, uh, man. So that last caller was talking about Gordon B. Hinckley, and you asked... Uh, why didn't he predict the tsunami? Yeah. Uh, what did Gordon B. Hinckley like ever predict? Like anything? Do you know? Or? No, they don't pick anything. And, oh. and, and the LDS used that verse that surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He reveals His will to the servants, the prophets. They use that as the proof text to say God will not do anything unless He reveals it to prophets. That means we're supposed to have prophets today. It's an Old Testament passage. So you just ask Him, well. Did God, you know, reveal to the prophets anything that's happened in our time, World Trade Center, any disaster? 
if he did, why didn't they tell us? You know, and so it just shoots their whole That's little saying, premise yeah. down. So yeah. that was the call you were calling on, Golly? No, no. Uh, yeah, we just wanted to say that you're great, and uh, we celebrate uh, Gordon Gee's best every year. So God bless, sir. All right, DR. Thanks, man. Yep. God bless. We're going to uh, Ryan in Salt Lake City, line two. Ryan, you're on Heart of the Matter. Oh, hey, Sean. How's it going? Hey, doing well. How are you? Good. Uh, you have a new look. I didn't, almost didn't recognize you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm growing out the hair and beard in honor of uh, church history that we're going to begin up in 2009. I'm going to try to go for a year without cutting it in honor of Porter Rockwell. Oh, Joseph that's Smith. Cool. That's cool. Joseph Smith told Porter Rock. I was talking about, uh, I was talking about the first show I ever saw with you. Um, it was during the Republican primary when Mitt Romney was running. Yeah. And that's when I first started watching your show because, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Mormon, but I'm not really active in the church. So I just, I'm more into politics. And I, I caught you talking about Mitt Romney the first time I saw your show. Oh. And you were kind of bagging on him. So I, I was quite interested tonight to hear you uh, condemn the Mormon church for getting involved in political campaigns when the very first show I ever saw of yours, yeah. you were pretty much getting involved in a political campaign. Well, you know what? What actually saved us from having the IRS shut us down as a 501c3 was the fact that we talked about a Mormon in president as a president and that our show is about Mormonism and that was a Mormon issue. So it really wasn't as political as you might seem. What I did, I didn't talk about his politics. In fact, on the show, I said he may, may be a great president. But I said, yeah. historically, no Latter-day Saint should have been uh, president because of what they want to do, which is take over the world. So uh, you, you don't think Mitt Romney wants to take over the world, do you? I no, mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not making a comment on Mitt Romney taking over the world, but I believe fully that the LDS Church longs to and will seek to take over the world if they get enough money and power. Abs I may sound like a radical. I know I don't look like it, but I, I may sound like a radical, but I fully believe that if given the power and might, they will do everything they can to take over the world. I read your book, uh, I Was Born Again Mormon. Are you still a communist, or was that just a brief phase? Uh, I wasn't a communist. I, in, I embraced uh, Marxism for a while. I sought that as a path to truth before I became a Christian. Yeah. And uh, no, I, I don't embrace communism, no. Okay, excellent. Well, I, I just wanted to give you a reason to ask you about that, and you've answered my questions, so have a good night, man. All right, you too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right, okay, we're going to Chuck and Layton. Chuck, you're on Heart of the Matter. What's up, Hi. Chuck? Hi, I uh, just had a comment. Okay. Uh, hearing you uh, discourse on eating and drinking, it just really highlighted for me the, the manipulativeness of the LDS Church. I remembered how you taught on baptism for the dead, and in that case, they isolate a single Bible verse in 1 Corinthians 15 and um, propagate a whole doctrinal system out of it with genealogical research, and et cetera, et cetera. But in this case, you read a whole chapter, Romans 14, plus all the other verses, but then in this case, they sidestep all that and go for whatever they want to do. Amazing. So uh, it really offends me, and... Uh, I just say, how dare they? I wish people would just read the, uh, the for themselves, research for themselves, and give God a chance to let the scales fall from their eyes. Amen. Really good point, Chuck. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. You know, that's a really good point. He just point made it something out, and I'm sure it was clear to you, but it just dawned on me. They'll take a little verse, and they'll build an entire superstructure theology upon it, where people are giving their time, getting worthy, paying 10%, doing all this stuff to go in and do these practices based on five little words. And then on the other extreme, they'll take entire volumes that prove one of their doctrines incorrect and ignore it completely. So it's just, he's right. It's just manipulation. It's control. It's tr and it breaks people's spirit. And we've always said the greatest damage that Mormonism does, in my opinion, is it takes people who long to know God, who really are in it from children, really believing and wanting to know God, and then when they see what it really is, they hate God. They can't stand anything to do with religion. These uh, post-Mormon uh, blogs and websites are full of hateful uh, people toward God, all because of the fruits 
of Mormonism. That's why we fight against it, not because we hate the Mormons, but the LDS doctrine. Don from Ogden on line three. Don, you're on Heart of the Matter. Uh, we, uh, we live, Sean? Yep, you're live. Hey, hey brother, I'm confused uh, on this. Sir, you got as far as, uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm lost, if it's okay to drink to where, I'm, I'm a recovering addict from all different things, okay? Yeah. Uh, it's got to help me, the thing that I'm still addicted to is the uh, nicotine, the tobacco, and I kind of look at that as, you know, this might be one of the things that, uh, you know, goes into the body, uh, but yet the gospel comes out of my mouth. Yeah. Okay? Uh, now, I'm looking at Galatians 5, to where it says the things of the flesh are manifest, uh, you know, the fornication, the uncleanliness, adultery, witchcraft, which in the Hebrew and the Greek, uh, witchcraft pharmacia. and sorceries, where we get the word pharmakia would yeah. be uh, pharmacy. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, to where anything that alters the mind. Now, uh, jump. alcohol today is known as familiar spirits, so or a spirit. A spirit, and yeah. And we know to be careful uh, to avoid uh, 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 you know, familiar spirits. Yeah. Uh, now I'm confused. Is, is is it okay to you know get, get a buzz every now and then from drinking some hard liquor, or is it okay for me to puff some marijuana every now and then? Uh, I'm gonna get in trouble tonight. It, it, I can it, tell. Uh, I know that there have been times in the past, I mean, this is not too recent, but I have smoked marijuana, but the spirit is overcoming. Yeah. You know, I mean, Don, I don't want to know about your sins. All right, I'm kidding. Listen, let me just answer this in the best way I can. God help me right now. Okay. There is nothing, as Paul said, in and of itself evil. It's what we do with it. If it's evil to you, you say you, had, you were an alcoholic, it would be wrong for you to drink alcohol. It would be, and, and also I think your jump on using pharmakia in the Greek to applying it to alcohol is not a good one. I think to, to uh, addictive drugs, you're right. And it, you it, could, it alters the spirit. Uh, it takes us away from the spirit of the Lord. Uh, I, and I know, and Paul said, be drunk with the spirit, not with wine. I'm not talking about drunkenness either. We're talking about having a glass of alcohol, a glass of beer, a glass of wine. For people that can handle it and for people that it's not an event to them, there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. As far as marijuana, Christians believe in obeying the law. So we are going to follow magistrates and kings and what the law says. Personally, I think that marijuana, I would prefer someone taking a joint than drinking hard alcohol. I, that's just my personal opinion, but it's against the I, law. I agree. So I would not recommend it. But as far as God is concerned... That sounds more like an herb of the field than anything else. Uh, however, however, let's not take this and run with it. Now, I'm going to get criticized because people say there's a lot of weak people in the faith, and we can have some weak people right now. Don't think I'm giving you the license to go out and drink if you have a problem with drinking or to smoke pot. It's against the law. I'm talking about the spirit of liberty that comes with being a Christian. You're not saved by the good you do. You're not condemned by the bad you do. If it's okay in your life, in your heart, the way your relationship with God to do those things, you're free. And nobody should judge you one way or the other. That's what the scriptures say. Okay, now, now I, I, I do agree with that as far as, uh, you know, not being judged, but yet, uh, as, I mean, scripture says... Uh, as if there be anyone in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. Okay. And I, I wouldn't go out, you know, and uh, be drinking. I don't see any use well, Don, alcohol let's, other let, than... Let me use uh, your example you know, right there. Uh, as an active Latter-day Saint, I didn't drink. As a Christian, I might. That's a new creation. But you don't drink to drunkenness. I'm, exactly. I am not recommending drunkenness. I'm just saying we cannot get steeped in the do's and don'ts of people's eating and drinking and Sabbath day and new moon worships and all that stuff is gone. It's gone. I think it's good advice for people. I don't think teenagers should drink any kind of alcohol. I think some of the laws are very good the way they're set up. I think some of the other laws are very bad in which they're set up. I'm just saying, I think people generally are getting the idea that, you know, if it, it would probably be better not to ever drink hard alcohol, probably for most people. Uh, but a glass of wine, I hear it has health benefits. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, he says in Timothy, go ahead and have your glass of wine. Okay. So there you go. I mean. But not strong liquor. I mean, I've, I've 
uh, found men dead from from alcoholism. And I found and, men know, dead from Fredoism. I mean, the gates of heaven, uh, or, or the, the drunkards. In the once kingdom. you start, though, when it comes to Christianity, I'm talking about. Once you start, there's no end to it. It's liberty in Christ and trust in him and don't judge others and if it's between you and God if you have a problem with it you better fix it but it, you know if there's no problem I wouldn't worry about it we got a lot of calls my friend got a lot of calls Don thank you okay thank you God bless you bye bye God bless you we're going to Travis and Draper first time caller Travis you gotta be quick okay you're on the air okay hey sorry to bother you see uh, earlier you were mentioning about the legless and the armless and the gays and the straights and uh Everybody is saved if they believe in Christ. And you said nothing about repentance. And I was just wondering if if you're a gay and you still practice being gay, are you still saved? Um, first response is, I don't know who's saved and who's not. Second response is, if, you, if, a, if a homosexual man had just practiced homosexual relations and then he comes to know the Lord and he repents and is hit by a car... And he still is a homosexual. It, I mean, he might not be completely changed. He's not completely sanctified. I would think that that uh, would hold true. He's saved. I, I would think that if a homosexual man or woman uh, uh, was having trouble with that in their life but knew the Lord, I would think that they are saved by the grace and blood of Christ. It's just like somebody who is a liar who comes to know the Lord. And they, they come to know him and they're trying to repent, but they slip back sometimes into lies. It's not, again, the action and activity. It's the faith in him who was perfect to save us that saves us. Now, you, if you have show me somebody who was a vile adulterer before they came to know the Lord, they come to know the Lord and they remain a vile adulterer without any conscience or trying to change at all. When they die, I would question whether they really knew the Lord. But we're talking about people who are trying and working through and trusting in God to help them gay straight. And I say legless and armless because in the Old Testament, if you had a, if you had a gimped arm or something, you couldn't go in the temple. So I, that's why I include all those things. Yeah, you know, and I understood that. But yeah, I What do you think? Any, well, I, I didn't hear anything about repentance, and I, I, I believe a gay can be saved, but I, I believe that if he repents, if he, if he tries to fight the urge, and he still, he's still got the gay tendencies in his mind, the homosexuality and everything in his mind, but he doesn't practice it, I believe he is saved. Or he well, can it, be saved. It, 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 I, it's, a, it's a really tough issue, and you know we're down to 15 seconds, but it's a great call. We need to talk about it more. Call back, will you, Travis? I will do that. Thank you, Sean. God bless. Listen, we're out of time. It was a fun show. This is a good topic because it opens up a lot of stuff that's difficult to talk about. We'll see you next week. General Conference next week. Yeah. Art of the Matter.